believe that is everyone. Correct. Now that I'm screen sharing, I don't have the uh, everyone's uh, beautiful faces in front of me. So with that, um, I will call the meeting to order at 12.05 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, I guess first point of business will be to um, approve last uh, Thursday's meeting minutes. Um, all subcommittee members should have gotten an email uh, with that. Is there any, has everyone had a chance to look over that? Are there any points of discussion, corrections, or amendments that need to, to happen? Or how's everyone feeling about the meeting minutes from uh, last Thursday's meeting? I think Billy's the only member of the subcommittee here, so I don't. We might have to wait until next. We might have to wait until Thursday to actually um, motion and second. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be my other question: is how's a quorum work? I wasn't sure if you were considered a member uh, a subcommittee, so we'd have I'm not, three out of the five. I'm not technically a subcommittee member. I'm more of a okay. uh, observer and again assisting you if there's anything I can do to help from my perspective here. Gotcha. Okay, well then we'll have to uh, postpone the motion to approve uh, Thursday's meeting minutes until the following meeting. Um, Nellie, is that okay with the state guidelines for the five days? Uh, it's five business days, so it, uh, it should be, yes. Okay, perfect. If not, just let me know and maybe we can do a vote by email on that. All right. Well, thank you everyone for our second sustainability subcommittee meeting for uh, yeah figuring out the adult use uh, cannabis regulation recommendations uh, for the beautiful state of Vermont. So for today's meeting, because you can all see the screen I'm sharing, and I think hopefully in in person in that room you have a screen set up. Um, we're going to be talking about kind of the environmental requirements that are in Act 164 um, and 62, as well as the existing regulations. So kind of taking it a next step from our last meeting. So I've gone through to kind of help guide the discussion for today um, and kind of outlined, pulled out kind of the environmental perspectives um, for discussion points, as I've seen them with what's contained in the Act. So kind of went through and looked at like what our requirements, I guess, our objectives of the subcommittee as written. And so there's definitely the uh, groundwater quality requirements um, and seeing with like a gap analysis um, or if there are experts um, in the committee, if there are additional protections we need for groundwater resources. Um, there's also building energy standards um, and comparing to the and I know from a previous um, CCD meeting, we have gotten recommendations um, for uh, indoor kind of cannabis uh, cultivation facilities, um, and then energy audits, um, and then their frequency, and then any other energy efficiency and conservation measures that may be applicable to cannabis establishments. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of point, oops, sorry about that, point out is um, making recommendations for um, the permitting licensing uh, for cultivators and cannabis product manufacturers, um, and what those conditions would be. And then also in Act 164, there was the priorities of issuing licensing. So it's whether the project or, you know, incorporates the principles of environmental resilience and sustainability. So I feel like that should be in the back of our mind as we move um, in future meetings and start to really get into the nitty gritty of what kind of standards and regulations we want to see is that does have, uh, we do need to come up with recommendations for how um, priority of licensing is, is going to take um, into, uh, into account. Um, what I thought was interesting um, within the definitions, so the three that I think are most important to the sustainability environmental um, issues involved in uh, cannabis cultivation and processing manufacturing uh, is that enclosed lock facility. Uh, means a building and a greenhouse or an outdoor fenced in area um, so that pretty much everything is allowed under the law. Um, plant canopy is the square footage dedicated to live plant production. Um, it doesn't include areas of office space um, or storage, etc. So I did want to kind of discuss on the plant canopy part is since it says live plant production, that's including propagation, um, Veg, 
and flowering plants. Is that how you've interpreted Kyle? I think right now that's what that, that broad definition means, yes. Okay, so I think that has some serious implications when you talk about small farms and has it written with a thousand square feet, which is the next point that a small cultivator, because um, a thousand square feet of canopy is very small if it's including all aspects of cultivation. Um, and just realizing that if people are applying for small cultivators, I think there's going to be more of them um, potentially. Um, so there would probably be some impact on there. And then the other interesting kind of, uh, I don't know, section 863 when it says regulation by local government. So Billy, I really like your input on this, on it has, I didn't write the actual, I should probably put in what the, the language says, but my question on that was what control over licensing and licensing tubs do municipalities have? Um, and the implications I was thinking of is can cities, municipalities, towns uh, ban or not allow indoor or outdoor cultivation? Um, and then are there zoning implications? Like are we gonna see a clustering effect uh, when it comes down to the, the local government level for issuing um, permits and licensing. So I think that's going to have a lot of uh, environmental implications. So I was wondering where we were at on kind of the macro level as all these committees are working um, on the role and the enforcement, I guess, and the power of local governments. Do you want me to respond now or wait till you kind of go through your deck? No, no, please, now. Um, this is not, yeah, the deck is not going to be dead by so, PowerPoint. It's just kind of making right, right. So, yeah. you know, I'm certainly no expert on uh, kind of municipal uh, law in Vermont, and I would encourage you to reach out to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, who are kind of a, a representative, broadly, of uh, local government in Vermont. Um, you know, I. but based on what I do know, since the act defines cannabis cultivation as non-agricultural. I'm assuming that whatever agricultural exemptions to local zoning exist for traditional agriculture goes away. So towns may be able to zone and regulate um, cultivation, if that's the case, if it's a commercial activity. Um, that said, I believe, but you know, you really should talk to the experts on this. I believe that you can't kind of spot zone uh, based on the particular activity, you have to treat like all commercial things the same. You couldn't treat the commercial cultivation of cannabis differently than another commercial activity um, in a, a zoning district. So I think if there's municipal regs related to commercial activities, those would, they may apply to cannabis cultivation. And I'm not sure that a town could create special zoning designations uh, for cannabis cultivation outside of just a generic commercial activity. Um, but again, I think the folks at VLCT, and there's a number of kind of attorneys who work um, for statewide on municipal law issues, uh, would be great resources in that regard. With and just kind of for future reference, like if, if I get like an agenda like a week or so ahead with some specific areas of, of inquiry, I can do some work in advance of these meetings to try to have better answers, but just coming in cold, um, there's only so much I'm be able to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and that's kind of why I was doing this PowerPoint to realize, you know, from our last meeting on Thursday till now, it's only been one day. Um, but now that we have until Thursday, um, I'm going to yeah get some more stuff out tomorrow and try to do as far as many meetings in the future as possible. Um, I do have a question with like your experience with with the planning and um, in Vermont, are we expecting, are you guys expecting kind of, are there any towns or areas you think that would be against having um, different cannabis cultivation or processing um, or retail throughout the state? Yeah, there's certainly, and you know, Kyle can probably speak to this. There's a provision in the act that allows towns to kind of opt out of um, hosting retail um, outlets and some town or opt in, I forget which it is. Some it towns have already take, yeah, some towns have already taken action on that question. Um, others intend to. So I think there's some sense of municipalities who are kind of supportive or not, at least of having retail outlets in their communities. I don't know if there's been any debate locally around cultivation or processing. 
Okay. Yes. Yep. So, it- so Jacob, my understanding my understanding is is towns can opt into having retail establishments, but they 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 don't have as much control from a from a cultivation perspective at the at the local level. I will also say just for the for the knowledge of this committee, because I'm sitting in, in multiple committees, um, the, this local um, control, local fees, local ordinance model, local ordinance question has come up in in compliance and enforcement and at the market structure committee, and those committees are definitely. Um, looking to make sure that everybody is of the same understanding when it comes to local control. I, I agree with, with Billy's overview um, from a retail commercial perspective uh, for the most part on, on local control. You know, I think they're going to be resigned to um, having those traditional local um, responsibilities when it comes to advertising, so on and so forth. Um, but, but as Billy said, they can't pay over, overly they can't, pay, they can't pay too much attention um, specifically to this industry if they aren't doing the same thing to, to other ones. The, the cultivation side of it and how Act 164 um, talks about local enforcement of cultivation is, is something the board is still working through with our general counsel to make sure we, we understand exactly what that means. Okay. Yeah. I just uh, wanted to bring that up because I'm... Uh as we're going through this, wondering if you know, we have to about clustering and then intensity of the environmental impacts. If um, you know, we're going to see, you know, we will see them in, in more major cities for indoor cultivation. But if there's um, that layer, we need to add to it um, when looking at setting potential um, energy efficiency levels, or you know, looking at power consumption, things like that. There's um, there's a couple towns I think in the Northeast Kingdom, which is more of the rural. Um, part of Vermont Jacob for your for your knowledge that have decided that, that they don't want retail establishments in their town I wouldn't if we're looking at a macro of Vermont I wouldn't say that they're towns that are gonna severely impact our, our market analysis or any, anything like that we do have um, survey out to all municipalities in the state of Vermont that are asking their intentions about putting this on a, on a ballot and kind of seeing who is prioritizing this um, over the next six months to a year. Um, yeah, so moving on, there's a section on prohibited products. Um, and what I wanted to have a discussion about, I guess, on this section is, so cannabis flower, uh, you cannot um, kind of produce or sell cannabis flower that's greater than 30% THC. And my, what came out of thinking about this from an environmental perspective is, one, what are people going to do with it? And the enforcement side of what happens when you cultivate cannabis, you're growing it, and then all of a sudden it tests above 30%. I'm guessing it can't necessarily be sold retail, but is that going to be allowed to be processed into manufactured products, edibles, concentrates, or does that need to be destroyed? In which case, I think there is a waste management um, issue there and making sure that this organic material can be, you know, that it's not, it's being diverted from landfill. So um, that's kind of what came up for that point. And then um, I, we can talk about all three and then have the conversation, I guess. But the other one is uh, the solid concentrates, no greater than 60% THC. And so I was wondering, this doesn't necessarily have to do with environmental sustainability, but out of just it's more like a public health thing is what are the dilution protocols? And how is that going to work if um, you know you make a run of distillate and it's 70%, you're going to have to dilute it with something. Um, just something to, I guess, maybe think about in other committees. Um, and then with the um, cannabis oils have to be sold pre-packaged for use with batteries is um, if everything, you can't sell like syringes or bulk oil, you're going to have a lot of pre-packaged um, vape cartridges, and that is also another waste management concern. So potentially we should be discussing kind of recyclability of that, or a potentially um, requiring kind of a take back scheme of the industry. Um, so I want to kind of see what your guys' thoughts were on on those two points, um, as we kind of, you know, we'll have a whole meeting kind of on waste management, but within the rules, I think those are two kind of concerns with the laws are written right now that are going to, I think, create more waste. I would definitely support the idea of having like a dedicated meeting on, on waste management where I can have kind of experts within our waste management division kind of speak 
in a higher level of sophistication to these questions. Um, you know, I did talk with them a little bit and understand that um, it's likely that some of the state's existing compost facilities can pro pro provide like a, a proof of destruction or I forget the exact term, but something to certify that a product has be, been decommissioned and is no longer available for retail use. Um, there's a number of different companies that have uh, export requirements around in in country use of the materials that they produce and need to demonstrate that they've been destroyed if they remain in America and our compost facilities can achieve that. Um, so I think that can provide at least proof of appropriate uh, disposition. I think the main question with the compost facilities is whether they have um, adequate uh, security to meet the, the requirements of the act. But again, talking specifically with the waste management folks in, in our environmental conservation department, I think can inform uh, both that question and questions around uh, uh, waste associated with uh, the materials, packaging materials. Yeah, I think when we have the waste management discussion, we definitely are going to need to invite, uh, like you're saying, the environmental uh, conservation people, but also the waste management, because my understanding from other states, and I imagine Vermont's going to be the same, is um, everything needs to be disposed of in state. It's going to have issues. You're trying to to cross state lines to use, you know, another state's landfill or something like that. So we need to know um, what capacity is, and also I think what, like, especially from a recycling um, plastics perspective, what um, is actually going to be able to be recycled um, and captured uh, with the um, technology and systems they have in place. Yeah, so we could get representatives from the, the waste um, industry and to kind of talk to those things in addition to our the state regulator folks. Perfect. Um, so then, um, as far as like the, the rulemaking cannabis establishment section, um, so there's the tiered system based on plain canopy, so do, we'll have to think about that. Um, I think we're pretty good uh, with the pesticide use um, aspect of it, with it being at least as stringent as uh, the VAAFMs, uh, pesticide control regulations, um, and so that's, there is some uh, a teeth to that. We do need to create standards for indoor cultivation. Um, and then as far as kind of manufacturing laboratories, um, not so much for the, well, it kind of goes into the, the last slide with the products not containing more than 50 milligrams of THC. I think it's just kind of doubling the amount of um, vape cartridges or, or concentrates we're gonna see in the market. Uh, so just another reason to really look at the uh, waste management aspects. Um, but then also, yeah, thinking about with the laboratories, there's the procedures for destruction of all cannabis samples. And so I think that's another um, waste management item to see how that can be um, destroyed or if it's, you know, organic material, how we can um, put in regulations or recommendations for trying to yeah, divert um, any organic materials from the waste stream. Um, and then moving on, so there are six licenses written into this law. Um, to think about uh, the cultivator, wholesaler, product manufacturer, retailer, lab testing, and integrated license. Kyle, I did have a question for you I thought would be good to discuss is with an integrated license, I saw that they can't have more than one license in each category. There was nothing explicitly written or that I saw um, talking about locations. So are they allowed to do multiple activities and have multiple licenses under one facility? a good question um, and I'll get back to you with a more firm answer but my understanding is you know I know that there's some facilities that would be um, eligible for an integrated license that kind of are have I've, I've been in this these at least one facility that looks like it has everything all the license types working under one location so I would imagine that we would allow for a combined location of these different license types, but I haven't been to other integrated license um, potential, you know, operations to kind of see firsthand how separate or combined things are, and I, I quite honestly haven't thought about that distinction all too much, so um, okay. we'll get back to you. Gotcha, yeah. Um, I'm just working on creating um, a, using the um, VS uh, market 
um, predictions to try to figure out, yeah, like how many facilities, how many sites we're going to be seeing. So like what those impacts would be. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they're, you know, I can then see, well, it wouldn't matter if there are how many integrated licenses there necessarily would be for the model if each one has to be separate, you know, but if they're combined, you do get some, I think, economies of scale savings on environmental impacts. Um, so then going to the cultivator license, um, I did have a question, um, or we have a discussion, we want to create recommendations for this, but in the, in the act, it says each cultivator shall create packaging for its cannabis um, as it's um, moving along, I guess, the process. And so my question was, what is non-retail packaging going to look like? And should we be creating recommendations for that? So if the cultivator needs to create packaging that has all the list of requirements on there, um, so everything dealing with track and trace, um, you know, uh, created date, et cetera, um, when it goes to a wholesaler or a product manufacturer or an integrated licensee dispensary, et cetera, um, do we want to create recommendations for the packaging to kind of promote uh, reusability of packaging? Um, or limit kind of the, the waste stream, the waste generation from that kind of system. Jake, it might, it might be helpful to know how other other jurisdictions that you have experience with um, approach that non-retail packaging and, and keeping you know the supply chain intact all, all the way to the retail establishment. Yeah, I would say that um, it kind of runs the gamut. Um, in my experience, there's some where there's no um, regulations at all. I don't think there's too much stipulation on it. There's a lot of just the regulations on creating it's like a manifest, as you will, um, that includes all the state required things in the act. Um, I think there's definitely opportunity to, um, at least in the licensing um, application um, aspect of prioritizing uh, licensees who um, want to do a uh, standardized kind of kind of unit. I mean, a lot of things are in these like uh, black bands with yellow tops, you know, a lot of things are uh, distributed throughout the supply chain with that and are reused, you know, in washable, cleanable, food safe, et cetera. Um, and so I think there's opportunities there to award uh, cultivators, manufacturers, processors who, who want to take that initiative and kind of create those systems. I think the only um, thing that would prevent that is if there are going to be regulations on um, the locking of this material during transport or um, any kind of those kind of safety concerns. Um, so I think that's just something to keep in mind. I think in the, if there's a transportation or uh, processing manufacturing committee, um, when they look at those rules for that. Yeah, we have a compliance and enforcement committee and, and it might be helpful to get a, a quick blurb from you, Jacob, on, on that and its impact um, for that committee if we're gonna zero in on how, what additional requirements might be, you know, there for moving this throughout the supply chain. Okay, yeah, and we can definitely pull from what's going on in the, the food agricultural supply chain industry. Great. For sure. Um, and then the other thing I saw that Act 62 included was that a dispensary can now also is permitted to cultivate and manufacture cannabis for the purpose of transferring and selling to an integrated licensee. Um, so just keeping that in mind when we're talking about when we create these recommendations and creating these um, environmental uh, requirements for the cultivator, that those are also going to have to be included on some level uh, with the dispensary license if they're going to have the opportunity. Uh, to also cultivate or manufacture. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so I had some questions um, and wanted to have a discussion. I know this is probably more Stephanie's area of expertise, and so um, I will be talking with her after this meeting um, so we can get her input at the next one, but uh, that cannabis is not gonna be regulated as farming under the required agricultural practices, but is going to have to comply with the required agricultural practices. And so what I really liked about how the law was written, I haven't had too much time to go through it, but that it doesn't disqualify, I guess, already agricultural businesses 
uh, their land or buildings if they're going to the cannabis industry from their uh, use value appraisal program, which I think is a really good environmental program you guys have in Vermont. So I think that's a big win for um, environmental and sustainability efforts. Um, there was this uh, B on this where it was saying that um, the processing, cultivation processing, manufacturing of cannabis uh, has to comply with all of these regulations. And I was wondering in Vermont, are there additional areas, cities, counties, kingdoms that have local environmental and energy regulations that we should be aware about as a committee? So just broadly speaking, most Vermont has state laws and then municipal laws. Um, we don't have much of a county government or other sort of um, structure in that regard. So there are municipalities that do adopt local bylaws related to environmental issues. Um, so it's a really kind of town by town analysis to see if they have uh, adopted rules that kind of ex exceed the minimum set by the state. So yeah, I, I don't guess. know that that would be the, you know, my sense is that this board should be focusing on kind of compliance with state law and then, you know, letting the individual operators with requirements that they also comply with municipal law and letting the individual operators navigate the municipal system because it, it's we have 251 municipalities or kind of units in the state and their approach to these issues can range broadly yeah it's gonna be my follow-up question was like should this even be a concern of ours um i do even though we're on a very strict pretty deadline um would it be helpful in your experience if we had created recommendations or guidelines or some kind of guidance for the municipality level um, as they're looking to um, you know looking at the permitting side of things uh, to have uh, uh, some kind of resource I think so um, and again that organization I mentioned earlier the Vermont League of Cities and Towns they own they put on kind of annual trainings for uh, municipal administrators both kind of paid uh, folks and the volunteers who run a lot of this, the, the towns and Vermont's boards and commissions. Um, they do a lot of outreach, provide technical assistance. So I think, you know, some outreach to them to see what they perceive their members would find valuable in this space would probably be a good step. Right, perfect, yeah. I think we'll probably bring them in towards the end once we have the kind of the state recommendations and everything um, starting to be fleshed out. Um, yeah, so the last thing on this was uh, would they comply with uh, required agricultural practices, which I'll go into in the next few slides. Um, something that pointed out to me is like in the way the act is written, it is saying that um, cannabis cultivation uh, operations need to comply with the RAP. Um, but when looking into the RFP, I did see that, you know, cannabis farms, they don't fit into any of the categories there. Um, there's the smallest category, which is certified small farms, which I believe is going to be over 50 acres. I just don't see um, many cannabis um, cultivators um, being on any kind of scale. So I do think that there is going to be uh, some language you'll have to create so that um, it makes sense for licensees um, to adopt these things. So right into the law, there's section 6, 8, and 12. So I'll go through those real quick. Um, on, I don't know, do they are you familiar with the required agricultural practices? I am, but not in a very in-depth way. Okay. That's really Stephanie, you know, Stephanie's agency is the one that administers those. Yeah. Correct. So, was it you, Kyle? I was just saying correct. If, if we need to get folks from Ag here to, to go over these more specifically, um, you know, that's something that we can do. Yeah, yeah. So I can um, go through this pretty quickly. Um, it's really coming down to just uh, kind of pulled out a bunch of things to have a discussion on this, um, but we can wait until Stephanie is, is at the next meeting. Um, but essentially, I think it's really good that this, uh, from an environmental sustainability uh, point of view, is uh, required because it does cover, I mean, the main point of the required agricultural practices, it does seem is for our water quality. Um, and water discharges and protection of the environment in service uh, areas, uh, surface water areas. So um, doesn't allow for discharges to surface water, mainly through direct like, pipes or culverts, et cetera. Uh, it does have regulations on appropriate storage, 
the nutrient management planning. And so I did pull out some things that stood out to me on, we need to figure out how that's going to get, um, like make sense. Cause a lot of it is, you know, made for regular traditional agriculture. So it refers to UVM recommendations for a lot. And I don't think those exist or are created for cannabis. Um, so it's definitely a Stephanie question with her um, expertise in the hemp and medical um, so industries. Mm -hmm. This, this, you know, for me raises kind of a, a larger and I think more significant question about like how are we actually regulating these impacts? Because the RAPs are largely a proxy for other state environmental laws that don't apply to agriculture because agriculture is exempt from those laws to, in one way or the other. You know, it's not a hundred percent, but basically, if this is a commercial activity, there's probably state laws and regulatory programs that address all these issues that may be the same approach or may be different than the RIP. So I think we, we probably want to go kind of resource impact by resource impact and just kind of clarify which, um, you know, which rubric is going to be applicable. Um, and then we can figure out if there's gaps in either of them that need to be filled. Does that, was that? Make that sense? makes that makes sense. I was um, under the impression with the way Act uh, 164 is written and how it has language of um, uh, can or adult use cannabis cultivators um, must comply or will comply. I can't think of the exact language to the required agricultural practices. So it was stated in that. So I was thinking that this was the minimum, and then expand upon it with the other state agencies. Okay, that, that's helpful. Yeah, I guess. If, yeah, I think if they're complying with the wraps, if they're if they're applying with other kind of applicable state law, they're they're going to be complying with the RIPs as well. Would be my sense. Yeah, because I started to look at the different um, state, uh, like the Vermont statutes, like Title Ten and Title Six and stuff. And then once I was like, going back through and reading the Act, you know, it just explicitly states the required agricultural practices. So, Kyle, I'd love to get the, the board's um, opinion on that. Got it. I'm, um, I'm, I'm taking note. I want to say also, and I don't have the statute in front of me, I'm trying to pull it up so I can make sure that I, I have the words right in my head, but because the small craft cultivators um, within that thousand square foot don't need to, they aren't considered commercial, the, the RIP language also um, was kind of like a backstop to make sure that those small cultivators were also um, their, their practices were reflected through those all right those specific sections of the required ag practices if that makes okay. sense okay that just makes sense yeah and so that language is in um yeah section, I guess it's section nine. um yeah and then section nine and twelve just goes through groundwater quality and subsurface tile drainage um so yeah so the things that i noticed were the gaps from 164 into um, other sustainability things is um, with the wrap, it doesn't explicitly state in the um, Act 164 about sections five or nine, which I think might be important to make recommendations on. So one's the water quality training to make sure that they're you know, knowledgeable, have a, a base knowledge expertise on the water quality issues in agriculture in Vermont. And then section nine, which is the construction of farm uh, structures, which I think is going to specifically new production areas. Um, with cannabis, I do believe that a lot of licensees will be building out facilities or expanding existing farm structures. So that might be um, something to look at as well. But I also think that that might be covered in Act 250, which I'm hoping to get your opinion on, Billy, and a little bit more education on that. And then other things that we might need to be looking at is there's no air quality pollution or odor control regulations. Uh, with Kevin, there is odor control as it pertains to applying manure, um, but mainly with the cannabis issue, we're seeing is odor issues, uh, odor nuisance um, amongst like neighbors in different areas um, that uh, cultivators are being in. And so it's definitely something that we need to come up with recommendations for. And there's no energy regulations and there's no like land management um, biodiversity regulations. It's really very water centric. There's, there's air quality regs at the state level um, <laughs> that exist um, that have already been, I think, exercised in the context of the, the hemp 
market. Um, so I know that you know air, air quality and climate division has been involved in kind of oversight and um, investigation of nuisance of neighbor nuisance complaints of of hemp processing and cultivation. So those regulations do exist outside the area, please. Yeah, I really, okay, I, I really wish <laughs> Stephanie was here, but she runs the, the hemp program. So um, if you need help connecting with her, Jacob, to get a better understanding of certain things before our next meeting, I can certainly help facilitate that. Um, I am curious on how her program has worked through the air quality, pollution, and odor control regs, especially on odor control, because you know, we have right to farm laws in Vermont, which, which help alleviate some of those nuisance claims that neighbors might have, but because this is not considered an agricultural product, what does, what does that right to farm actually look like here and how do odor control regulations um, maybe, maybe apply differently from a, from a nuisance perspective? And, and even when they do apply, I can say that these are some of the hardest um, considerations to enforce because there's so much subjectivity to right. what is perceived as an, a nuisance odor. Um, and so we struggle, you know, outside of the ag sector in, in enforcing um, odor regulations in the state just because there's so much variability and subjectivity to them. So I think, you know, we can share that information, both the kind of statutory and regulatory information, as well as the direct experience of our regulators in, in trying to investigate and enforce these concerns. Um, and this may be a place where the board chooses to just come up with uh, their own standard um, if they so choose to um, to help mitigate odors so we don't have to rely on a regulatory framework that is is hard to enforce sometimes yep what we're seeing in a lot of places with yeah the mitigating of odors um because it is so subjective and very localized um is kind of having safeguards in place if a cultivator is making their best effort by using, you know, industry leading or best practices with mitigation equipment that that they can't necessarily be uh, penalized because of that. Um, and, and the whole kind of good neighbor thing, but I think that also is very much on a municipal level as well. Um, and so uh, definitely something to, when I reviewed the HAP standards, I did not see too much about the voter issue. So I definitely will con reach out to Stephanie when we start discussing that. Um, and then, yeah, so Billy, this is really what I was uh, hoping you could shed some light on, because I know we had mentioned it in the last meeting, started to dig through it. Um, but from my understanding for Act 250, that the areas that this would trigger requiring a Act 250 permit for cannabis cultivation or, or processing would be with the improvement to commercial industrial use above 2,500 feet, uh, improvements on more than 10 acres um, within a town without permanent zoning and subdivision regulations, if I was reading that right. Um, any kind of change to a grandfathered building, so something that's pre-1970s, and then if they're withdrawing um, 340,000 gallons of water. Is that correct that Act 250 will get triggered if any of these happen? Uh, generally, yes. And then there's probably more, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the subdivision one is probably less applicable. You know, that's going to look at just the subdivision of land for whatever purpose. So um, yes, if if land is being subdivided and a resulting parcel is going to be used for a cannabis-related industry, um, you know, that subdivision is going to trigger Act 250 review. But that's that applies broadly. Um, and I would imagine these folks are all, are going to focus on kind of lots that exist and not be subdividing land to create their enterprise. But so it, that seems less applicable. Um, the construction of improvements is probably the biggest one, and it's actually on more than 10 acres of land only in towns that have permanent um, bylaws and and subdivision regulations. In towns that lack. Um, zoning and subdivision regulations, it's a one acre parcel trigger. So um, in towns that don't have good or, or you know, robust municipal bylaws, um, any acre, any parcel an acre or larger that is supporting those improvements would trigger jurisdiction. And it's not just like, it's not the um, area of disturbance, it's the actual size of the parcel. So. That's why the whole agricultural, like the farm question, 
raises some questions for me. So like most farms are bigger than 10 acres. Um, if they want to have a component of their agricultural operation be uh, cannabis cultivation, and that's commercial, um, is that going to trigger Act 250 jurisdiction at that site? Um, and then, you know, are they going to need to obtain Act 250 permit for some portion of their their enterprise? Billy, that's that's my biggest that's my biggest question in my understanding of, of 250 and how this how this works. That's that's certainly my biggest question and my biggest concern as well. Right. And I've talked to Greg Vogel, who's the general counsel of the Natural Resources Board that administers Act 250, and you know, discussed this question with him a little bit. And I'm not entirely clear where they stand on it. Um, he indicated that there's ways to likely kind of reduce and limit jurisdiction to just the area being cultivated for cannabis and not pull the rest of the farm into Act 250. Um, but given what Stephanie said last week about the tendency for crops to be rotated and that cannabis you know, plot to maybe move around on the farm, um, there may be some challenges there. Uh, there's also other activities um, that require Act 250 permits where the permit um, goes away after the activity is concluded. Uh, those are primarily uh, gravel and sand extraction operations. In all other cases, Act 250 um, liens basically are, are, are perpetual encumbrance on a, pro on a parcel. But for a gravel and sand pit, after you've kind of closed out your extraction and met all your decommissioning requirements, Act 250 jurisdiction does go away. So there may be an opportunity to kind of apply that model here if um, Act 250 is in fact going to exert jurisdiction over these operations. That that's great to know, Billy. Do you and uh, you probably don't know the answer to this from a from a timeline perspective, procedural perspective? I'm sure that there's not a whole lot of examples of. Well, maybe there is a lot of examples of that that process, you know, playing out. How long does that typically take um, to work back out of 250? It can go pretty quickly. You know, usually those sorts of businesses are operating for many years, right? It might be like a, a gravel pit that's going to operate for 10, 20 years, um, and then they decommission and uh, jurisdiction is released. I, I think the kind of closeout process can be fairly quick. It's, it's basically like going through another Act 250 amendment process, uh, just showing that you've met the conditions of your uh, decommissioning plan and the uh, um, the permit. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it has to be overly burdensome, but you know, it, there is some process associated with it. I think it would be much simpler here. You just have to show that you're no longer cultivating cannabis. You know, with those projects, there's like engineering and other things that need to be brought to the table with this. I think you would just have to, you know, put in an affidavit or something that says you're no longer doing the activity. Right. And on that point, I did pull from the uh, Vermont Agriculture and Food Systems Plan for 2020. And so in the hemp section, which I believe Stephanie had a role in, it was saying that 60% of growers were less than five acres and 40% um, of the cultivated acreage by eight growers. And they were averaging between 50 and 100 acres. So I'll give you some kind of understanding of the size of growers, at least in the hemp world, um, of what we might be seeing as far as uh, applications and licensing. Jacob, I actually helped put that whole plan together. So, any other questions you have on it, let me know. I wrote the ag policy brief. Oh, nice, nice. Um, no, I mean, I was just looking at it because I was just digesting everything I could find on Vermont agriculture and kind of what's there. Um, I did like the way, you know, looking at climate change and looking at what Vermont is concerned about with the farmers right now um, as far as issues that they're facing and will be facing more of. Um, so, things definitely to be. Um, of concern. I want to kind of relate this to what we see in the the wrap and then the other um, any other potential regulations and then compare them to kind of best practices. And I think that's how we're going to get our recommendations. So these are definitely things we'll be focusing on. Um, it does seem as though with the water quality phosphorus runoff is a huge concern, especially with your your lakes and streams. Um, and then one thing that came uh, I wasn't quite sure what section it was, but kind of uh, I thought it was a good opportunity was for the young farmers and looking at the social equity components and seeing how we can encourage that um, from an environmental sustainability, you know, cultivation um, to align with, you know, what the goals are of the state. It does seem like succession is a huge issue. 
the amount of retired farmers predicted in the next five years, or I guess three years by now. Um, and so I think it's a big opportunity when we start to talk about social equity. Um, and then just going back to a previous slide, it does seem as, yeah, if Act 250 is going to be invoked, um, yeah, it covers pretty much all environmental impacts that we would have to, to look at. So I guess, Billy, since you have the most familiarity with Act 250, is it worth us going through and pulling out um, language uh, that might be useful when it comes to, you know, water conservation, wetlands, um, soil erosion and drainage, um, as we're looking at the recommendations. If not, all of the farms are going to need to essentially require an Act 250 permit. What I would recommend you do is work with the Act 250 Natural Resources Board and task them with developing guidance for how and if Act 250 applies to this sector. Um, it's a highly complex and specialized body of regulation, and um, there is there's significant amount of kind of guidance documents that have already been developed for each of the criteria um, through my agency, through the NRB. So I, I think that charging them to come up with that is your best bet. I think what's really needed from the, the cannabis board is a clear articulation of how and if Act 250 will apply to, to this work. I think once those questions, the like if and how are answered, then there's capacity within Act 250 and my agency to kind of come up with guidance for how folks navigate the process. But that threshold question needs to be answered first. And, and Billy, uh, just, just, and, just my last point, and many of these criteria can be satisfied by other state permits. Like for instance, to satisfy the wetlands criteria, generally you just have to get a wetlands permit or show you don't need one. So it isn't as complex as this initially reads, but it, it, it still is a lot. My understanding is, when, like reading through it, um, is that like Act 250 though is kind of the most stringent um, environmental regulations that Vermont has. Yes, it definitely has um, considerations that are unique to Act 250 jurisdictional projects that don't apply to other forms of development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so it, one. it it only applies to like I think less than 10 percent of all development in the state, so it's not broadly applied, but when it is applied, it, it is more stringent than the baseline. And Billy, just... Um, Jacob, Jacob, if we could just stop for public comments for a moment. One, Sorry, we just want to... Yeah, thanks, Gina. One, one final 15 seconds, just for information for the committee. We, the board has, you know, contacted some community planners at ACCD and made contact with the NRB to, to to start understanding the impacts or intended or un, unintended and expected impacts that this emerging market will have on Act 250. We have not gone as far as asking for any, you know, formal guidance from the NRB or through the Attorney General's office or anything like that, but, but you know, something that we'll consider. Awesome. Uh, yes, and I'll open it up to public comments. Dave, no? I know that surprises you. <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk later. Ashley, do you have any public comments? No, thank you. Okay. No, we're good on this end. Okay. Um, yeah, and so like with that, um, Billy, who is a good person for me to reach out to um, that's overseeing kind of Act 250? Um, I would um, I would contact their chair, which is the, the person who's in charge of it. Um, his name is it's an interim chair, Don Rendell. Um, the other two staff people who will be most helpful is our general counsel, Greg Bolder, and the state coordinator, Aaron Brondike. That's kind of, I think, their executive leadership at this point. And, you know, this is a pretty, you know, high levels question for them to dig into. So I would start right at the top. No, I'm happy to yeah. provide you those contacts. If, but they have, they have a website, Natural Resources Board, um, Act 250, either of those should get you there, and, and all their contacts are, are on that website. And Jacob, we can, we can work on our end to connect you with them. You know, um, we know the former chair um, fairly well, too, to the extent that might be helpful for just a, a download. 
Yeah, I think uh, getting a download and also um, since this is, looks like it's going to be, depending on where everything, if in the lens um, or if and how, this does come into play, um, giving it as much heads up as possible. Yeah. But, um, but Chris, Greg, Greg is going to be the most, he, he's probably the person who's in the best position to kind of explain how Act 250 may apply, what the implications that are, and kind of get into that level of detail. So I think Greg Bobel, the general counsel, is very knowledgeable, and I think I've prepped him for the conversation. So if you're just looking for like an initial kind of point of contact um, to frame the question, I think he would be a good one. All right, perfect. And Jacob, if we need to work through our general counsel to talk to their general counsel to get that more, less informational, topical understanding and, and start digging into what may apply and what may not apply, we can, we can certainly do that as well. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then I think as a, so for our next meeting, while well, we have a few minutes, um, we're definitely gonna talk about a uh, meeting strategy um, or like how things the next month will go um, for Mondays and Thursdays and kind of get ahead of this um, a bit, um, as well as the cannabis process um, presentation. Uh, I guess I'm creating, I don't think we need to talk too much about the uh, what government agencies are going to be overseeing what and their capacity and all that. We could look at that, I think, towards the end once things are written. Um, and then looking at, I think, the way things are written right now for cultivation um, and with the, the RAP requirements, potentially these Act 250, um, want to talk to Stephanie and see what else would be um, there. I think that covers a lot of the environmental impact, sustainability for outdoor cultivation. And then really we need to focus on indoor cultivation. So I wanted to talk to you, Billy, uh, about what resources should we be looking into um, so that we're not reinventing the wheel that would be most applicable for, for indoor cultivation and manufacturing. In the context of permitting or what exactly do you mean by resources? So in the context of environmental sustainability, so I know that there has been um, submissions of, uh, for building infrastructure efficiency for lighting, um, but seeing what else is out there as far as the environmental um, kind of impact mitigations uh, for indoor cultivation that are already kind of like on the books or other agencies are, are overseeing that. Um, I know there might be like lead, if there's lead standards already existing in Vermont, while it is more occupational focused, we can look at to see, you know, what's there for, for recommendations or requirements um, for kind of the uh, indoor cultivation aspects of things. Um, yeah, so I think from like on the energy side, I think the efficiency utilities that I mentioned at our last meeting, like Efficiency Vermont and mm -hmm. some of the distribution utilities are going to be in the best position to um, provide guidance there. The Vermont Public Service Department potentially as well. Um, on kind of more broad environmental considerations like air quality, water quality, waste management, you know, I think our agency has expertise there. Um, and you know, can provide guidance, you know, I would approach it more from like uh, topic specific, you know, like let's talk this week about kind of water quality challenges, opportunities. Let's talk this week about kind of waste management, you know, opportunities and challenges. Um, Cause I think that just may be a, a easier way to manage the conversation than trying to have like a broad sustainability dialogue. Cause there's just so many, I don't, I don't know all the implications of indoor cannabis cultivation. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't tell you what the best kind of resource is because mm -hmm. um, I just don't know enough about it. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. No, no, it does make sense. And we're not, yeah, we are going to have those. That's how it's going to like for energy, indoor, outdoor, waste, indoor, outdoor. Um, I just wanted to yeah pick your brain to see if there's anything. Like, um, we, like we, we probably have like BMPs for like basic manufacturing and other sorts of commercial enterprises that I can try to dig up, um, but I just don't know if there's anything specific to um, this act, this particular activity. Gotcha, yeah. So I'm gonna be sending everyone um, a bunch. I've got, I don't know, five or six best management practices guides for sustainability in indoor and outdoor cannabis cultivation. Just kind of try to 
weed them out so I'm not sending everyone 140 page documents rather like the 15 most important pages kind of thing um, but yeah I was just seeing if there's already things that Vermont has in place that we could build off of but we can come uh, discuss that um, as those meetings start to go down so I'm going to try to get the schedule out to everyone tomorrow early Wednesday for our Thursday meeting yeah things are just kind of you know going to be back to back for the next month or so but yeah try to plan out those future meetings so we can bring in the experts we need um, and uh, to discuss the different uh, specifics. So I think with that, we can adjourn this meeting. Okay, great. Yeah, I think just scheduling like a loose agenda for every meeting we have between now and when we have to end would be really helpful for me to make sure I can line up the right people for the conversation. Absolutely. You don't want to hear me speculating for the next month. Yeah, no worries. Uh, well, really appreciate your time uh, and your insight. And uh, thank you as well, Kyle and Nelly and Gina and the two public uh, community members who came and sat in. And uh, I guess we'll be talking on Thursday. Thanks, Jacob. I'd say move to adjourn, but I don't think there's anybody to second him. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.